yes, thanks, Nati, for the introduction. Um, welcome also from my side to this uh, second last session of the Congress. Um, my name is Nina, and I'm presenting today research that I've been uh, conducted in part of my doctoral dissertation. And uh, yeah, my co-author is also here today, uh, Karl-Johan Lagerqvist, and uh, this uh, data has been collected while I was uh, a visiting researcher at the Swedish University of Agricultural Sciences. Yeah, the topic of today's session, meat. For some people, this looks super appealing, makes them feel hungry, makes them put on the barbecue, get around friends and family and have a nice dinner. Um, but actually, meat is not that good after all. So we see that global levels of meat consumption are rising, and this is associated with negative effects on human health, environmental sustainability, and obviously also the animals who are the origin of these food products. There is growing consensus that a transition in consumers' dietary behavior towards a meat-reduced or plant-based diet is necessary to circumvent or at least reduce these negative effects. So what can we do to achieve this transition in diet? How can we reduce consumers' meat consumption behavior? So to answer this question, um, we can take a look at the cognitive dissonance theory. This is a framework that was developed by social psychologist Festinger in the 1960s. And the core of this theory states that whenever people have mental conflicts, that causes psychological discomfort. So a mental conflict can be anything. It can be um, the conflict between I know I should do one thing, but actually do something else. So whenever you have an inconsistency between your cognitions, your knowledge and your behavior, or even um, conflicts between different cognitions. So in the case of meat consumption, we can see a possible source of a conflict. On the one hand, people knowing that their meat consumption patterns are negative for environmental sustainability, health, animal welfare, but having meat consumption behavior on the other hand. So, um, yeah, since this state of dissonance is experienced as negative, it's an, a negative affective state, um, people want to usually get rid of this state. So what can they do in the case of meat consumption? It's fairly easy. Um, they can just reduce their meat consumption levels um, and avoid meat. So a change in behavior is a cause, is, is a solution to this uh, dissonance experience. But we have to ask ourselves the question, are consumers even aware of these um, mental conflicts? Do they experience negative effect dissonance in relation to meat consumption? And the literature actually gives reason to assume that people do not, are, um, do not um, feel these conflicts because they tend to evaluate meat rather positive because it's tasty, because they think it's necessary for a healthy diet. Um, so a lot of misconceptions around meat. And another issue is Consumers very often dissociate meat from the animal origin. So when people eat meat, when they make the decision to eat meat, they very often tend to forget that this is like was a living animal that had to be killed for, for ending up on the plate. So um, what we want to answer in this uh, research is what is the effect of triggering these conflicts on consumers' meat avoidance behavior? So what can we do to trigger these meat-related conflicts? So we can, on the one hand, explain the negative impact on health and sustainability. So we can really increase people's knowledge, make them aware of these negative effects. And we can remind people of the animal-meat relationship. So we can try to make them more aware that animals had to be killed to be consumed afterwards. How can we do that? We took a look in the literature and searched for um, different uh, approaches to make these conflicts explicit. And common tools are, for example, providing images. So show people images of an animal and the food product next to it to remind them of this animal meat relationship. Um, or just use textual information in which you explain um, the negative health um, and environmental sustainability link. In this regard, we can assume that images might have a superior effect than textual information for a variety of reasons. Um, images are processed very differently than words, and we see that they um, also lead to different responses in the consumers, so that they are more memorable, they lead to higher arousal, so images might be more effective to, um, to make these conflicts explicit. Um, but then one problem arises um, when we look in the literature, how can we measure cognitive dissonance? You would assume that this is a well um, uh, researched theory by now, that there are also plenty of different approaches to measure cognitive dissonance. 
this is actually not the case. And um, different review papers has pointed out that actually, although this theory has been around now for more than 60 years, we still lack decent measures of cognitive dissonance. So this is a second aim of this present study, um, introducing a measure of metered cognitive dissonance. So yeah, the central research objective of this paper is to investigate cognitive dissonance or meat-related cognitive dissonance as a mechanism to explain the effect of information provision on meat avoidance behavior. So we came up with um, this model uh, in which we have our uh, independent variable information provision and our dependent variable meat avoidance. And in a mediating framework, we want to investigate how does meat-related cognitive dissonance mediates the relationship between information provision and meat avoidance. To do that, we performed an online experimental study with 379 participants that were recruited from Prolific. It was an international sample with, I think, the majority coming from Europe, as Prolific is also hosted in Europe. Um, but we also had uh, participants from other uh, parts of the world. And uh, the design was a basically randomized control trial with a two by two between subjects design. So we randomly assigned participants into different experimental or control conditions. And uh, this two by two between subjects design involved the factor text, so information, textual information, whether they received a conflicting text or a control text, and the factor image, so whether they received a control image and a conflict image. And in combination, this leads to four conditions. So we had um, one condition, for example, where people received only the conflicting text um, or received the conflicting text and the conflict image and so on. So what did we do exactly in the experiment? So the experiment had three main pillars. There were some other things on the side, but I'm focusing now on the most important ones. So uh, first we provided people with information, then we measured their cognitive dissonance levels, and then we measured meat avoidance. So first they received the information according to the condition that they were assigned. So we had, as I said, the factor um, text, and we decided to use um, health information. So the health information text outlined negative effects of red and processed meat on uh, health effects and also describe positive effects of a meat-reduced diet. And uh, the control text was about a random topic. We selected the University of Bonn, and we made the two texts to be um, as equal as possible in terms of being of equal length and of equal complexity. Um, next to it, we had the image presented. So this was the experimental image that was sought to um, evoke dissonance by reminding people of the animal meat link. And uh, the control picture with no animal meat links, so just the food products. Um, both of these approaches, as I said, has been uh, established by previous literature, and uh, especially this one here with the animal meat uh, link has been investigated by a series of research um, that uh, when you show people then rather cute animals um, that are the origin of a food product, um, yeah, creates this discomfort. Um, then we applied the measurement of cognitive dissonance. So um, based on what we thought is appropriate to conceptualize cognitive dissonance, we have come up with uh, this measure. So um, we came up with the statement, how do you feel about your own meat consumption to acknowledge the fact that cognitive dissonance is an affective state that's always related to a specific uh, situation. And uh, we came up with these um, items to conceptualize cognitive dissonance, and uh, they should reflect um, that dissonance is actually a continuous state, so you can either be um, aligned and have no conflict, which is the state of consonance, which would be represented by this end of the scale, or you can be in this uh, conflicted state, this dissonance state, which is uh, represented by this um, end of the scale. Some of these items have already been used in other research, but in a way that they had some limitations. Um, so we modified existing scales uh, from uh, other people and came up with this measure of uh, mediated cognitive dissonance. So um, yeah, the measurement had an um, excellent internal consistency that the Kronbach's alpha was quite high, which signals that the scale is internal consistent and uh, yeah, fitting to construct cognitive dissonance. Um, I forget to say that we also performed two pilot studies beforehand um, in which we tested different variations of the scale. Um, this one appeared to be most promising, and if there are more questions to the pilot studies, um, feel free to come back to that in the discussion. 
Then we um, adopted the measurement of meat avoidance. So um, we thought about what's most promising to measure meat avoidance. And uh, yeah, due to limitations of COVID-19, we had to go with a um, hypothetical uh, um, stated choice. So we let people decide between two sandwiches that they uh, would hypothetically want to receive for dinner. So one's um, a ham and cheese sandwich or a tomato mozzarella sandwich, or as make it as realistic as possible, also um, an opt out option when they want none of the two. But I have to stress again, it was only hypothetical. So participants didn't receive the food product afterwards. Okay, before jumping to the results, I want to briefly explain you the kind of data analysis method that we applied. So as I already mentioned earlier, we performed a mediation analysis and we followed the approach from uh, Andrew F. Hayes and used Process, the tool that he developed. Um, and uh, yeah, this mediation analysis includes the analysis of direct and indirect effects. So you investigate directly what's the effect of information provision on meat avoidance and on uh, dissonance, and then also indirectly test whether the effect of information provision um, on meat avoidance is mediated by dissonance. So basically, um, two equations are used, one linear regression and one logistic regression, um, but I come back to that in a second. So how did we specify the model? Um, we used for information provision three indicator coded dummy variables, because as I said, we had three experimental and one control condition, and each of the indicator variables to reflect information provision were evaluated um, against the effect um, in the control group. And then the mediator, MRCD, meat rate cognitive dissonance, um, was used as an average score from all the six survey items. And uh, meat avoidance um, was inserted as a binary variable. So as I said earlier, we had these uh, choice tasks with three possible outcomes. And we binary coded that into zero equals meat approached and one, zero, uh, and one equals meat avoided. So the meat approached basically um, was, was just when people selected the, veg uh, the, the ham and cheese sandwich and the meat avoided was both when people chose the vegetarian option and the opt out option. Okay, now I want to walk you through the results that we found. So the first equation investigated the effect of information provision on the mediator, MRCD. And what we find is that information provision triggers cognitive dissonance. So in all conditions, um, people reported higher levels um, of MRCD compared to the control group. And what's interesting, we see that the magnitude of the effect of the text and the image is more or less the same. So we don't really see that images have a much stronger effect than texts, as uh, one could have assumed based on the literature. And of course, the ones uh, who received the combined treatment, so the image and the text, they had the highest um, magnitude of um, meat-rated cognitive dissonance. Um, the second equation um, investigated then the effect of the independent variable and the mediator on the dependent variable, so meat avoidance. And uh, what we do see first is that um, meat avoidance, uh, meat dissonance, <laughs> significantly uh, influences meat avoidance. So the higher people's MRCD is, the more likely they are to avoid meat. And what we also see is that information provision has no direct effect on meat avoidance and there was also no total effect. So uh, just by purely um, showing people's information provision and putting that in the regression with meat avoidance, uh, we wouldn't see a, an effect. Um, but what's now the key of our analysis was the indirect effects analysis because we were aiming to find a mediating effect. So um, what's happening in mediation analysis is then you take the coefficients from the um, effect of the independent variable on the mediator and the coefficient from the effect of the mediator on the dependent variable and you multiply these effects and construct a bootstrap confidence interval around them and based on this investigate um, whether there is a significant mediation effect or not. And uh, since we had these three conditions, we also had three mediation pathways. So the effect of text, images, and the combination on dissonance and uh, meat avoidance. And uh, we do see that all of the relative indirect effects are significant, signaled by the only positive confidence interval. So what we can conclude based on the mediation analysis is that MRCD mediates the effect of each experimental condition on meat avoidance. So basically, um, both images, text, and the combination lead to significant meat avoidance by inducing this meat related cognitive dissonance. 
All right. Um, so now I want to summarize the key findings again. So uh, we can say that triggering cognitive dissonance with pictures and textual information is effective. And we can see that cognitive dissonance leads to meat avoidance. So we actually could confirm the central assumption of our um, of our hypo of our research that when you trigger dissonance uh, with information and uh, um, pictures, this leads to meat avoidance as a, a method to reduce the negative effect from this um, meat um, dissonance. Um, some findings were more or less surprising, like that images had no superior effect. And uh, yeah, we went to the literature and thought, uh, why is that? Why didn't we find a superior effect of images? And uh, we came up with one explanation, um, and that is rooted in the way how we compose the pictures. So um, we found a paper that investigated the effect of photographies versus animated images versus textual information. And they found that um, photo photographies are actually processed quite similar to textual information. And since uh, our picture was composed of different photographies, um, this might be the reason why we didn't find a specific effect. So if this would have been, uh, would it be replicated, um, it would be super interesting to test the effect again, but not with a photography, but then with an animated image, um, and then uh, observe if we find superior effect of images. Um, yeah, and then um, there was no direct effect of information provision that also came as a surprise to us because we saw that in previous research there were direct or total effects of information provision on meat consumption. But of course, um, you can ever have suppressing variables that basically undermine the effect. So, for example, people might have also showed reactive responses in uh, in uh, response to our measurement, uh, to our um, manipulation. So maybe these um, other potential suppressing variables basically canceled out the effect of MRCD and then we couldn't see it in the direct effect analysis. Um, but yeah, um, in mediation analysis, it's not required to have a direct effect um, in order to find a significant one. So we think we don't think that this is a very big issue. Um, of course, we have the main limitation that our design was not incentive compatible. So originally this was planned as a lab study in which people then also could choose the sandwich, but then yeah, COVID came in and it was not possible. So I think it would be super interesting to replicate this with an incentive compatible design. Um, so there's lots of uh, yeah, remaining analysis to do. Thank you very much for your attention. I'm very happy to connect with you. So if you have any questions, feel free to uh, yeah, find me via email or on Twitter or on any other social media. And lastly, I want to thank uh, the German Academic Exchange Service, um, the DAID, for financing uh, this project and for allowing me to be a research visitor at the SLU and also the Bonn Graduate Center and the BICS for funding the conference presentation. Thank you very much. Well, thanks a lot for the very, very um, interesting, nicely presented uh, study and presentation. I was just wondering how one um, can implement that in the real world. How can that be used? Is it going to be like on cigarettes or? Yeah, so it's uh, interesting. Uh, thank you for the question, first of all. Um, it's quite interesting that you are asking now immediately for cigarette uh, packages. There is actually a study uh, published this year um, who used um, uh, like cigarette-based warning labels in the context of meat consumption, and they also used graphic warning labels. Um, they had a little different framework, um, not cognitive dissonance, but um, they work with other mediators. But basically, this would be an exact application. So, of course, you could print these things on products. Um, I'm not sure if it's super realistic that this is going to happen soon. Um, but, of course, um, you can use these findings in other contexts, for example, in public information campaigns or in, in health communication or whatever. Um, so I think it's mainly important to know that these uh, approaches, textual information and images have an effect when they induce dissonance. And um, I think there's plenty of opportunities to, to communicate to people in form of textual information or uh, images. I hope that answers your question. Yeah. Great. Thank you. Hi, um, I, I'm sorry if I missed um, the beginning of your uh, your talk and, and so I'm asking a question that you already brought up, brought up. But um I was just wondering in the group that you know did the did the experiment, did you get any information from them about like health it, health issues or anything? Because could there it, would there be a possibility that they may be avoiding meat because 
So I'm not, like, if I understand your question correctly, you're basically asking whether we knew about people's background in terms of health knowledge and current dietary behavior. Do I see that correct? Yes. Yeah. Um, so what we did was we pre-selected people who are regular meat consumption and um, pork consumers. We specifically asked for pork. So we assume that um, everyone in the study um, at least um, occasionally consume pork. Um, we didn't specifically ask for, for knowledge about this because it's very hard to measure knowledge, um, especially objective knowledge, um, and especially in an information framework, because when you first ask people, do you know about the negative consequences, and then you want to do a manipulation of this, that's very hard. Um, um, yeah, and, and there's this other kind of knowledge, um, subjective knowledge that you could measure. So you could ask people, um, do you think you know a lot about the negative consequences? Um, we actually didn't do it here in this study, but we do it. Uh, we did it in a previous paper of mine. And here we found no effect of um, this uh, subjective knowledge in uh, the context of health information. So therefore, we also didn't consider it for this one. Um, but basically, yes, it should be a moderator, I think. And if people already have this knowledge, um, then probably they respond less to the health information because they know it already. And there might be still some effect because, I mean, although we know something, we might still sometimes yeah, voluntarily forget it, uh, let's say it like this, and uh, still creating this awareness um, again, although people might know it already. Um, but I think it's a very valid point. And yeah, thank you. Yes. Um, so as I mentioned, we had this uh, design with the three pillars and there was some stuff in the beginning and some stuff also in the end. Um, and uh, we actually also measured some covariates. Um, and as I said, we also performed two pilot studies. And in one of the pilot studies, we also specifically measured hunger. And uh, we also threw it in the regression just to see if it changes anything in the pilot studies, but it never produced any significant effect. So we thought even if people in the experiment might be hungry, then it still doesn't really play a key role in this uh, context. And um, we also try to be in this experiment to, to be as most parimonious as possible. So without including too many variables, we don't need. And uh, since we randomly assign people in the different conditions, um, we only focused like on the really key important variables and therefore um, here decided uh, not to measure hunger. Right. Uh, thank you all for coming to this presentation that we titled uh, Supply Shock and Bargaining Power, uh, Evidence from the U.S. Beef Market. Uh, this is a joint work between myself, Francisco, uh, Marco Duarte from, from University of North Carolina, Chapel Hill, and Melima, who is with us uh, today as well in the room uh, from Purdue University. Um, the views here ex uh, expressed here are uh, ours, uh, do not represent the, uh, the opinions of the Federal Reserve System, Purdue University, University of North Carolina, nor uh, Nielsen IQ. Okay. So uh, supply chain disruptions have been in the forefront of uh, public policy discussions, right? Uh, and disruptions on the supply side can cause a myriad of imbalances, and those imbalances are likely to be more frequent uh, and deeper uh, due to climate change, the lingering effects of pandemics, cyber attacks, and so on, right? Of course, such disruptions, they tend to induce police response, policy responses from, uh, from the authorities. Have two examples here, right? After the pandemic, the USDA uh, came up with this billion dollar plan to improve supply chain resilience uh, to, to shocks. Uh, and uh, US Congress just passed this bill on subsidies to, sem to the semiconductor uh, industry, right? Of course, uh, with all the um, 
all the, the, the these policy responses. Uh, the, effic the efficacy of these policy responses depends on how firms react to these disruptions, right? For instance, many of these disruptions and the policy that follow them can lead to entry exit and firms change their uh, pricing, uh, pricing strategy, right? So uh, despite the centrality of firms' reactions to supply shocks, we uh, actually have very little evidence of on how firms behave after these shocks, right? Um, this is not surprising, you know, given that to understand firms' reactions, we actually need to have a very clear idea uh, of the vertical relationships that uh, for, for each industry that is facing these disruptions, right? And this puts a high requirement in terms of data, right? To understand these vertical relationships, we have to, be, to have very detailed data, uh, firm level data. Uh, it has to be over multiple, multiple periods and across several markets, right? So this is, this is really, really difficult uh, to have. Uh, but for, for those markets in which the structure is rationalized by a, an oligopoly, we have an additional uh, problem, which is, uh, well, uh, for these markets in which we have uh, um, an oligopolistic uh, structure across the supply chain, uh, we actually have an additional problem is because we also have to understand vertical bargaining, okay? Uh, and with every uh, supply disruption, this uh, bargaining power is actually uh, likely to change as well. So this is what we want to study, right? We want to study the changes in bargaining power. We want to uh, study the changes in bargaining power uh, after a supply chain disruption. And we're going to argue that the U.S. beef market is actually a good case study, right? It is a good case study because uh, the supply uh, chain uh, of, of uh, the beef industry here in the U.S. is comprised of um, an oligopolistic uh, structure in at least two levels of the chain, right? Uh, producers are relatively uh, smaller, right? Uh, cattle ranchers. Uh, on the processor level, we have Tyson, Cargill, JBS, and the National Beef taking um, around 80% of the market share. And at the retailer level, we have national and local chains. Uh, but at the geographical, uh, uh, at geographical markets, so certainly we can uh, rationalize this as, as an uh, oligopoly, right? Uh, we also talked a lot uh, with players in the market, and we think that the relationship between processors and retailers in the supply chain can be characterized as a as, as successive uh, uh, bargain, right? The supply that we're going to, the supply shock that we're going to investigate is actually very interesting. Uh, it's a fire that um, hit uh, a major U.S. beef packing plant, right? Uh, it is uh, a fire on the Tyson's largest plant, uh, which actually has five or six percent, uh, around six or uh, five or six percent of the U.S. capacity of processing beef. Um, this fire happened on August of 2020 uh, of 2019, uh, and this uh, this plant was actually shut down from August uh, to December of 2019. Right. So again, uh, we want to see the effects of the supply shock, this fire. Uh, uh, that we want to see the effects that this supply shock had on the processor and retailer relationship in the U.S. beef market. Okay. So a little bit on uh, the data that we're going to use to investigate uh, this shock. Um, first and foremost, we have Nielsen scanner data. It's a weekly fresh beef price, uh, has weekly fresh beef, uh, fresh beef price information. Uh, at the UPC level, right? So it's uh, it's very detailed. It's, it's at the level of the product. Uh, more than 130 retail uh, chains, more than 200 beef brands uh, across 205 markets in, in across the entire uh, 49 US states, right? At any given market month, national brands comprise around uh, you know 44% of sales, and private labels uh, have around 56% of, of the market share of, of the sales. Right. We also have information uh, that we extracted from the Livestock Market Information Center that uses information from the USDA. Okay, and we collect data uh, from from LMIC on. Uh, cattle prices, uh, volume of uh, of cattle, and average wholesale prices. Okay. So the first thing that I want to show you is that this fire actually had some bite in the market uh, of 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 beef, right? Um, and we are going to analyze the impact of this whole comp fire. That's the Tyson plant, right? 
uh, across the supply chain of beef using the following information. Uh, we have uh, the cattle prices, which we use the average price of national weekly direct slaughter cattle, uh, forest years and heifers, uh, purchases uh, that are negotiated and domestic. In terms of wholesale prices, uh, we use the average price for national weekly box beef cutouts for negotiated sales. Retail prices, we come up with this bundle of all uh, of all beef retail cuts surveyed by, by Nielsen, right? And we extract the prices of this bundle. Uh, and in terms of retail sales, we use the sales of this bundle that, that we created as well, okay? Using, using uh, Nielsen information. So uh, let's examine how the whole Colm fire impacted uh, the, the market uh, prices and, and sales uh, of, of beef across the supply chain, okay? Uh, and uh, from top to bottom here, we have, you know, cattle prices, wholesale prices, retail prices, and retail sales as defined in the previous slides. Um, the black line here represents the actual, the observed prices and sales, right? Uh, according to the data that we collected. Uh, the vertical line here, yes, the vertical line here is actually the uh, second week of August. That's when the, the fire took place. The dashed blue line uh, is actually the predicted prices uh, using seasonality uh, trends before the fire, right? So this is actually the expected prices that we would see uh, if the fire had not happened. Okay, and uh, and the uh, blue uh, intervals here, the blue area here is just the confidence bands on these predictions, right? So what we can see here is that, you know, for cattle prices after the fire, um, most of the price variation can be actually explained by seasonality factors, right? So the fire did not have any bite in terms of changing cattle prices, okay? Now for wholesale prices, after the fire, we can see that wholesale prices shoot up, right? Uh, actually shot up uh, and they are uh, not predicted by general seasonality factors, right? So uh, actually the fire then had a, a, an immediate impact on wholesale prices. In terms of retail prices, um, right after the fire, we see no uh, impact, but uh, cumulatively we see that retail prices increase after, after the fire, okay? And finally, in terms of retail sales, uh, it's exactly the opposite, right? As, as prices increase, retail uh, sales starts to decrease. So at an aggregate level, uh, we can see that the fire has bite on two parts of the supply chain, wholesale and retail, okay? This is aggregate data, right? Now, we wanna see how this fire impacted different processors, Tyson's, GBS, Cargill, and National Beef, right? So what we do here is we do this reduced form regressions uh, in which we have uh, product level prices and product level volumes on the left-hand side of this reduced form equations. And on the right-hand side, we have an indicator for the post-fire uh, uh, period. And we interact this post-fire period with, um, with uh, the process, with processor dumps, right? So again, this is at the, the retail level. Um, Focusing, uh, it's, it's a lot of information, so just let me summarize what happened based on these equilibrium equations. Uh, the fire had a negative impact on retail prices for Tyson products uh, and a positive impact on prices for other processors, right? But in terms of volume, we actually found limited impact for all of the players, right? Across, um, across, across uh, retailer, retailer brands, okay? So good, right? That, that's, that's interesting by itself, but can we rationalize these effects by a simple supply and demand model, right? And the answer is no. So what I'm showing here is a little, you know, toy model uh, in which we have the, the residual demand for Tyson products and the supply for Tyson products, right? After the fire, this was a big uh, shock in terms of processing capacity for, uh, for Tyson. Uh, basically, Tyson lost scale, which is an impact on marginal costs, right? Uh, with an increase in marginal cost, this is just a leftward shift in, 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 the, in the supply curve, right? What this causes, of course, is an increase for, par for, uh, for the price of Tyson products uh, and a decrease in, in quantities of Tyson products. That's not what we found in our equilibrium equations, right? We found that uh, the fire had a negative impact on prices. 
So one way to rationalize the negative impact on prices then is that the residual demand for Tyson products actually shifted left, right? This would be consistent with a decrease in prices for Tyson products, but it also needs to be that the volume of Tyson products decreased. And we don't find that, right? Uh, we had limited, the reduced form equations showed a limited impact on, on, on the quantity of Tyson's products after the fire. Uh, so basically a simple supply and demand model cannot explain what we are seeing. What can explain what we are seeing are differences, are differences in terms of bargaining power that can alter prices and will not alter uh, the, the equilibrium volumes that, that we are seeing in the market, right? Uh, so our, we are, have a very direct path. We are gonna build a bargaining model and see if we can rationalize uh, all these effects. Uh, we need a little bit of structure to measure uh, bargaining power. So we're gonna build a structural model to, to, to examine these effects, right? The demand model, right? The demand model uses a traditional uh, and standard BLP demand model, right? Which is a discrete choice model of demand for fresh beef. Uh, indirect utility here uh, is additive and separable on, on beef, uh, fresh beef characteristics, right? And we allow for variation in terms of uh, uh, the effect of prices, in terms of income, number of children that household have, uh, households have uh, on the number of children that they have, right? And household uh, size as well. Um, market size here, right? Uh, standard BLP demand models need market size. Uh, we construct that by the average monthly consumption of, uh, uh, of uh, fresh beef in per capita terms and multiply it by the DMA population as most of these studies is do, right? Um, it's a demand model, so shares, right? Quantities and prices are endogenous, right? So we have to, we need to have some instruments uh, for, for the price coefficient. And we use uh, the share of processors product in a retailer shelf space uh, as one instrument. We also use differentiation IVs. This is very popular in the IO literature. Not gonna go over them, but happy to talk about them later. We interact with differentiation IVs, which basically me measure the Euclidean distance between characteristics with median household, household income in each one of the markets, in each one of the DMAs. Uh, and we try to include cost shifters as well, but they prove to be very weak uh, instruments, right? So this is our demand model, very standard. And we have some preliminary re results, right? So let's look at the right uh, foremost column, which is our BLP results. Uh, thanks God, we estimate a downward slope to demand curve. Uh, and additionally, we find that welfare households are less price sensitive, which makes sense, uh, and then tend to consume uh, more beef as well, right? Um, very interestingly, we find that the median on price elasticity uh, for the database that we have, and this is very detailed database, is uh, around 4.7, right? Which is much higher than uh, than what generally other studies uh, find, okay? But this is at the aggregate level. Uh, these are our results for the demand, right? So good, they make sense. We are happy with them. Our supply model then. What we do with our supply model is we uh, have this bargaining gaming between retailer R and wholesaler uh, W. Uh, the objective function here is that retailers and wholesalers will negotiate price, wholesale prices W to maximize what we call a disagreement, a joint disagreement profit, right? So in other words, they want to bargain enough in terms of prices such that uh, they reach an agreement on prices and then can maximize the disagreement profits, right, that they have. Uh, and this is, this is what this uh, objective function here is showing. Uh, however, uh, the parameter that we're interested in is this lambda parameter, which is the relative bargaining power between uh, retailers and wholesalers. And basically what this parameter does is uh, split the rents, right? So uh, the highest the lambda, the more, uh, more rents will be captured by the retailer, right? The higher the lambda, uh, the lower rents will be captured by, by, the, by the wholesalers, the processors, okay? On the retailer side, retailers compete choosing retail prices. So they, max, they choose prices to maximize 
uh, their joint, uh, the, 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 their profits, right? According to all products that they are selling. Um, on the retailer side, very, very standard uh, maximization uh, problem, okay? FOS, uh, FOCs, uh, first order conditions, solve this, uh, these structural models, right? So um, what I'm showing here is basically the retailer's uh, Bertrand Nash solution in which prices are, e are equal to wholesale prices. Uh, so retailer prices are equal to wholesale prices plus uh, marginal costs of the retailer plus some uh, uh, markup, right? Some margins. And this, uh, actually, they, we have closed form solutions for those. And I can show it to you uh, if you're interested. Uh, the solution for the bargaining gain, the wholesale prices uh, equal some uh, weighted wholesale margins, right? Which are then weighted by uh, the ratio of bargaining parameters plus uh, some marginal cost at the wholesaler level, okay? We can add the retailer solution and the wholesaler solution. We get equation number three. We do some more um, algebraic tricks. And basically we get our estimated equation, right? Which is which has prices minus uh, retailer uh, margins at the left-hand side. That's what we're calling Y here. Uh, and weighted wholesaler margins and uh, marginal costs at the right-hand side, right? So this is data, this is data. We can parameterize this, and then we can estimate uh, the theta parameter, which is basically one minus lambda over lambda, right? Uh, the question, of course, is, are, is this equation uh, identified? And we are going to claim that, yes, they are identified. And the way that we uh, are sure that they are identified is through differences in market structure uh, for different markets, right? So differences in market structures identify the bargaining parameter conditional on identical product demand. And I'm gonna show you what I mean by this. Uh, imagine that we have uh, three markets, right? In market, way, in market A, we have a wholesaler W selling product one and two to retailer R, right? In uh, market C, we have a different wholesaler, a different processor, uh, which we call W prime, selling product one prime and two prime to retailer R, okay? And then we have a third market here, market B, in which we have whole, uh, uh, processor W, selling pro uh, product one to retailer R, and, uh, pro and, re and processor W prime, selling product two prime to retailer R as well, right? If we work out the math, we're going to see that the solution for the system of equations is given by equation 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, and 10, right? Now, assume that consumers cannot differentiate between product 1 and 1 prime, and consumers cannot differentiate between product 2 and 2 prime. I assume further that we do not have market B, right? So we eliminate equation 7 and equation 8. If consumer perception between product one and one prime is the same, and product two and two prime is the same, then the margin here, theta uh, delta R, is going to be exactly the same for market A product one uh, and market uh, C product one prime, right? Same thing, uh, if uh, products cannot differentiate between product two and product two prime, uh, then uh, the delta R uh, for product two in market A is gonna be exactly the same as delta R for product two C, right? Uh, therefore, if we do not have market B, we cannot pin down the difference between delta uh, theta R W prime and theta R W, right? They're gonna be estimated to be exactly the same. Now, if we include market B and we have the whole entire system of equations, we can see that this part here that are market red are completely exogenous uh, to uh, these margins uh, uh, delta R over here for each product, um, um, for each product, right? Uh, which means that we have enough exogenous variation to be able to identify the difference between the, uh, theta RW and theta RW uh, prime, okay? Uh, so basically we found our instrument, right? Uh, we just need market variation, uh, market structure variation to be able to identify different bargaining parameters. Uh, what we find, well, we have some preliminary evidence that on average, 
Tyson lost bargaining power with retailers after the fire, uh, but this is very relationship specific, right? For some pairs, Tyson retailers, uh, you know, bargaining power increased uh, uh, for some retailers, right? Uh, also, on average, other processors gained bargaining power or had bargaining power unaltered after the fire, okay? And this is more or less in line with what we were predicting. Um, again, these are preliminary results, right? We haven't taken into account some uh, simultaneity bias in the supply side estimation, uh, and we still have to work on some components of the marginal costs, uh, which will lead us to actually to, uh, to, to have more instruments on the supply side, okay? In addition uh, to measure the average changes in, in bargaining power, uh, we are particularly interested in the heterogeneity changes uh, across processor and retailer uh, pairs. So we have to do some work on this regard. Uh, and uh, once the determinants are found, we can basically use simulations exercises to measure you know, how bargaining power affects various policies in response to, to supply side disruptions. Uh, this is all that I have. Um, happy to take questions if you have uh, any. Uh, this is my email contact. Uh, Mailing Ma is also here if you wanna if you wanna discuss the paper afterwards. Uh, yeah, thank you. Thank you again. Thank you. Okay, for the this session, the end of this session, I just introduce myself and say I am Mati Mohammadi, a PhD student from Purdue University. I'm working on my dissertation. It is a part of my dissertation with Dr. Alan Gray from Purdue University that is not here, and Dr. Brady Brewer that unfortunately he's in our, in a room now. Um, my the title of my work is Effect of Adopting Blockchain on the U.S. Beef Industry Structure, and I want to see that from a cost theory perspective. I will start with introduction and motivation. Then I will tell you the relation between blockchain and supply chain, blockchain and transaction costs specifically, and then blockchain and vertical integ integration. Later, I will talk about the conceptual framework and how I will tackle this problem in the methodology section. And at the end, I have a discussion section. Today, there is an increased pressure on the beef industry, on the food and agribusiness firm to be more transparent and traceable due to a number of factors, such as enhanced food safety, verification of sources, improved um, productivity, and reduced losses. And uh, to cope with this pressure, they need to consider the adoption of the technologies such as tags, RFID, technologies like blockchain and IoT to enhance their information sharing and in order to respond to the traceability and transparency demand that comes from consumer side. Different survey confirmed that the transparency, the transparency demand trend. For example, label insight survey indicate 94% of their respondents says it is important for them to know what it to know what is in the food that they are buying from the brand, and also two thirds of the respondents say that they find value if they have access to in-depth information about the product that they are buying. But how firm respond to this demand in the absence of the widespread? Uh, adoption of the IT like blockchain and other information technologies, some firms are choosing to vertically integrate and own all the process to answer the transparency and traceability. There is an example of the Walmart and Costco that they have a huge investment to respond to the transparency and traceability and they uh, own the upstream firms like Costco announced a 400 million investment in poultry to see if they can have it from egg to bird for their $5 register. But how about when we have information? If they have information technology, it reduces information asymmetry in the supply chain. And if it reduces information asymmetry, then it can reduce transaction costs and then they don't need to vertically integrate it and they can just vertically coordinate. We have example of Walmart that in 
2018 announced the blockchain ad adoption for leafy green and it's uh, mandated all of the supplier direct and indirect supplier for the leafy green to adopt blockchain and report all of the data that they have to walmart our study objective is to determine how change in information asymmetry due to adoption of the blockchain platform lead to a different vertical boundary decisions by firm in the food and agribusiness space. And the sub and objective of the, this paper is understanding the driver of the firm level decision making on the adoption of the blockchain and find the optimal level of the information sharing for firm in this in the industry, specifically in the beef industry, and estimate how blockchain platform affect coordination costs, and finally determine how changing information asymmetry and coordination costs affect industry structure as a result of adopting blockchain. What is the blockchain? And what is the relation of the blockchain and supply chain? Blockchain introduced the world in 920 in 28. And talking about the blockchain, the first thing comes into mind is Bitcoin and cryptocurrency. But in gen more general sense, blockchain is more than just um, cryptocurrency. It is a new emerging technology that records every inventory, finance, and information flow and stores them as a digital block. When a piece of permission information or block gets entered to the chain, other computers in the network are notified. And this makes falsifying and manipulating of the information very difficult. And it is expected that at least seven, at least 10% of the global GDP being stored on the blockchain platform by 2025. And also McKinsey report, reported that about 70% of the value of blockchain report, refers to a cost reduction. Blockchain technology can reduce supply chain related costs for business between 0.4 and 0.8%. Blockchain enhanced traceability and transparency with more than 79% and blockchain is an immutable, disintermediate, decentralized, trustless and transparent distributed ledger, which can positively impact supply chain performance. What are the blockchain properties? Blockchain is an immutable distributed ledger. And it means when a transaction is recorded on the blockchain, it cannot be altered over time. It secures all transactions in supply chain and reduces the data inaccuracy. Blockchain also is this intermediate. It means that it will remove the middleman and the need for the third trusted party. Also, it could shorten the supply chain. It's a decentralized, and it means that the data on the network is accessible and monitorable for all parties from all over the network. And the transparency, that's one of the most important properties of the blockchain. It means that the data network is visible and traceable for those users who have access to the system. How about transaction costs? We have three different definitions for that. One is the code that post defined that as a cost of exchanging good or services in the vertical market price or between vertically integrated firms. And also Williamson, Williamson said, symmetric information and other drivers such as frequency, uncertainty, asset specificity, and the rational boundary between firms and market. And we have a definition of hubs that says that the transaction cost is information related costs, including the cost of searching for information, bargaining and negotiation costs and monitoring costs. We refer to the last definition for this paper. Blockchain and the transaction cost. The first dimension of the transaction cost is searching cost. And what is the searching cost? The cost that incur when the incurred by firms when they need to search for information about products, input and services. These are costs arise prior to purchasing the product and services. Searching costs account for, the, some study shows that searching costs account for approximately 11% of the total transaction cost. And how blockchain affect the um, searching cost? As we told, blockchain has a traceability and transparency properties and blockchain add traceability and security to the supply chain and allows supply chain participants to share information with whom, whomever they want. And it lowers search and information costs. Also, blockchain facilitates the path for sharing reliable information with upstream and downstream firms in the chain. It improves collaboration across the supply chain and lowers the searching information costs. Until now, we know that if they adopt blockchain, it could help them to reduce information searching costs. 
Next, we have another dimension of the transaction cost. That's a negotiation cost. What is the negotiation cost? By definition, it happens during the purchasing process. And when parties of the transaction negotiate around product and services. The negotiation cost will increase when there is information asymmetry between firms. But what happens when we have a blockchain? We, as we predict that, we, we actually thought that when we have a blockchain, it should also reduce the bargaining cost. But we see that blockchain makes sharing information throughout the supply chain easier and reduce asymmetric information. However, after having information of but when both parties have information, reaching an acceptable agreement among parties will be more difficult since both parties have information about the other party's profitability. And studies still find that implementing blockchain will increase bargaining costs. What about the third dimension? That's monitoring and enforcing costs. Monitoring and enforcing costs arise after purchasing and writing the contract. And how blockchain affect this? dimension of the transaction cost. Blockchain is a secure information, sharing information, and firms in agreement can view the agreement terms after signing the smart contract via the blockchain network. And just we see that if they have the smart contract and they have the blockchain, the monitoring cost will decrease. And the relation about the blockchain and vertical cost, one way we, we told that one way to reduce the information asymmetry within and between firms is to adopt new information technology and communication method. As more firms adopt information sharing technology, this may reduce the incentive to in integrate through supply chain. And this lead them to more vertically coordinate instead of vertically integrate through supply chain. In this study, we have three different structure, arms land market, integrating with other firms and coordinating with other firms that I will explain each of them in the next slide. And we have four different costs, internal costs such as the communication, data trans transferring and agency costs, external costs such as the transaction costs and production costs that all of other costs that directly related to producing the product. And lastly, we have a blockchain adoption cost. We have we, the first market structure is an arm land and structure. As we see here, it's the baseline structure that we are working in this work, in this paper, and this is the pure market before blockchain adoption. Firms in each tier have a buying and selling interaction with upstream and downstream firms. Firms mm, objective is maximizing their own profit independently, and each firm in the supply chain concentrate on a specialty and uses an economy of a scale advantage. In the second market structure, we have a vertical integration. In the vertical integration, as the red line, we see that there is a firm's owns and control under common ownership. Firms are, um, and firms integrate vertically to empower themselves and use this centralized authority to increase bargaining and market power. Firms prefer to make their input in a part of their own integrated unit instead of buying it from outside and firms behave as one unit and have an interest in maximizing the entire chain's profit. And lastly, we have a vertical coordination. It is after adopting blockchain platform. Firms collaborate fully with their partners, but they have their own ownership. Firms that working together while maintaining independent ownership are able to compete with other supply chain entities and new information technology like such as the blockchain move, move firms toward coordinate instead of integration. How we want to tackle the problem that I mentioned? There is a two approach to answer the question, one simulation and one analytical. And uh, we, we here choose the simulation since with the analytical approach, it gives us the optimal solution, but we are not looking for the optimal solution. We just want to study what happened for the supply chain after adopting the blockchain. Supply chain process, um, supply chain process forces players to reevaluate and revise their decision when the new information becomes available and supply chains players have a dynamic interaction. So system dynamic approach that deals with complex system and capture the interaction between system variable is a suitable choice for the, for observing supply chain structure. How we want to work with this? Actually, what we have in our, in our model is identifying the variables 
that uh, it could be with the literature review and expert interview, and then identifying the patterns and stack and follow diagram, and then going to a different, finding the different scenarios and developing the model, and lastly, testing the model. This is the basic model of the beef supply chain and overview. Uh, here, the figure shows that the basic model and we want to, we want to use in our study to show, um, we, we, we should define the system boundaries. And here the boundaries is from cocktail producer to retailer and consumer is out of our boundary. Then we need to identify endogenous and exogenous variable that here consumer demand is our exogenous variable and all other variable are our endogenous variables. And uh, demand of the trans demand for the transparency and transparent beef is the shock to, it, to the system. And then we need to find the causal relationship among the variables and find the stock and flow diagrams. We have four different scenarios to answer our question. The base model is the stable one that all variables on our, their initial value and there is no integration and coordination and no choice of the blockchain adoption. Then the, we have a base model that uh, in the base model, we have increasing consumer demand for transparency, but there is no blockchain adoption. There's just, they want, but there is no adoption for blockchain. In the third model, we have a base model, but, but we have also the blockchain as an adoption, but consumer doesn't need any transparent beef. And in the fourth model, we have a base model with increasing the consumer demand and also blockchain adoption as an option. What we found so far, but in a literature and experts told us about the drivers that firm agribusiness that helps agribusiness firms to adopt blockchain. We find that building trust or cost of the adoption, data security, desire for traceability and consumer loyalty, software and hardware availability, minimizing costs and improving uh, performance and consumer willingness are what the different literature says about why firms should adopt blockchain. And uh, the expert interview until now that we had about four or five interviews with different people, they just confirmed what we had and they added responding to consumer demand, facilitating data sharing, tracing the food from its origin through the supply chain. These are the supply and demand curves in the different scenario that we have. In the top left, we have the base one that there is a no blockchain and no additional cost and no change in demand. In the other three one, we have a cost that imposed to the retailer itself or to the retailer and to the processor when there is a need for the transparent beef and when they adopt the adopt blockchain. We are using this different uh, supply and demand graphs for our model at the end. This is the um, preliminary causal loop diagram that we have for our beef supply chain. It started from cocktail producer and at the end we have a consumer demand. The, um, the plus sign shows the positive effect and the minus sign shows the negative effect. For example, here we see that if the consumer demand increased, then the meat price increased. And if the meat price increased, we have a uh, increase in meat supply. And with this one, we can show it's a, a basic version of the uh, causal loop diagram and later the stock. We are using this one to show the stock and follow diagram. Uh, sorry if it is really busy and tiny one. It is a part of, it's a screenshot of the model that I'm working from a software. I'm using this one to show in a different model that suggests retailer side, how, what happened if each of the variable change to the profit of the retailer side and then to the um, processor side and then feed lot. And at the end, we want to just compare this different uh, answer of the profit to see and to just observe supply chain after and before a blockchain adoption. And what we found until now, we find that blockchain has the potential to reduce the cost of the beef supply chain and blockchain implementation facilitates sharing information between beef supply chain participants. As the cost of the beef supply chain transaction and information asymmetry between firms decrease as a result of the blockchain, they will be more incentivized to vertically coordinate instead of vertically integrate. And then I should tell you, I'm in the earliest stage of the modeling and do not have a complete model. 
which represent the whole supply chain yet. So any suggestion and feedback is highly appreciated. Thank you. Sure. And uh, from your uh, causal diagram there, I what I'm imagining is that you have equations that connect. Both, yes. Correct? Each of these variables are connected with the equation. So is your goal to have a welfare measure at the end? No, we're just comparing profit. We don't do anything with that. We have a different, like, you know, for example, we have for the profit, we have an equation of revenue minus cost. And in the, we have an equation for the supply and demand. So if you have all of these, actually, you can compute welfare, right? So it would be interesting to have this, you know, I, I, I get your point. Uh, and just see if the baseline of vertical coordination or vertical integration actually leads to higher uh, welfare. Uh, who are the winners, who are the losers, so I did think that like, there is a lot of efficiency and distributional effects that you can get out of this model. So, for instance, when you say welfare, welfare to the, the Packers, the consumer, so, so the progress was consumer surplus, right, uh, across the entire supply chain. Uh, and certainly, I know I don't know what's connecting those, but now these stockers are losing uh, rents while you know the processes are gaining rents. Uh, so this is these trade offs between. And I think this is possible since you have all the equations. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you for your suggestion. Thank you very much. Um, Eddie, I'm certainly not a, a user of this type of model, but I was wondering what is the time frame? Time frame? For those models, isn't that everything is static? There's no uh, dynamics, dynamics in the model. Uh, I'm using a week as a, I can change it to a month, but I use the week as a, for the start draft of the, my work, because everything in the beef supply chain could be from week to year, but I'm using the week time frame for now. I have and retailer and also partners and producer, yeah. sometimes the order does not immediately translate to the increasing supply of the ones for I didn't get that. Sorry, can you repeat the question? <laughs> I didn't get the first one, but not, not the question. So uh, there, there, there are labs. Yes. In the beef supply chain. Yes, it is. When consumer demand increases, it does not immediately translate to an increase in the quantity supply or the supply curve. Yes. Itself. I was wondering if there's a statement there of the model or yeah. What this model can show us, like maybe I have one of them here, is like this one, the delay that we are just mentioning how many days we have. We have for the from order time, that is consumer order, at, or for example, from the time that we have a cow and pregnancy time, all of them could be as a delay, and we are add all of delay to the mother. Yeah. Yeah. There's also an inventory goal in memory line, so like that little blue box on the bottom right, right? So whatever stage that is, uh, there's an inventory level, so if something happens with the disruption, it's not going to ripple until the inventory levels are used up. Okay. Yeah, for example, we are here say that at the inventory, but what about the required, how many we required and how many we expected? We are just using the different you know, timeline to just capture all of the lags in the supply chain. Thank you. And any other question? Thank you so much, everyone, for being here and to thank our presentation today. That was really nice to have you here today and also in the AA meeting these three last days.